Hi everybody, so today we're looking at an overview for um, chemical bonding. Um, chemical bonding is a huge chapter in chemistry um, because it comes up in so many different places. But yes, there is a, a question on chemical bonding. It's usually question 11 um, and you know question 10 and question 11 are both have an A, B and C and you must answer um, either A and B or B and C or A and C. Basically you must answer two out of the three. They're worth 25 marks each and chemical bonding is usually worth 25 marks. Now, it's not just there that it's worth, um, worth 25 marks. It could come up in question four and it has done regularly or it could come up in organic chemistry and it does come up there. So you do need to have a really, really solid grounding in chemical bonding. Now, when I teach chemical bonding, I divide it up into six sections, as we can see here. Um, just a bit of forewarning here, today is just an overview. I will be doing about four, maybe five um, chemical bonding videos um, later, which will go over, um, which will go over um, specific exam questions. So there won't be any specific exam questions until it's just an overview. Okay, let's get started. So electronegativity. So this definition is asked quite often, okay? It is the relative attraction an atom in a molecule has for a shared pair of electrons in a single covalent bond. The word single isn't always mentioned um, in exam papers for marking schemes. Um, it's a definition that comes up incredibly often. Okay, nearly every second or third year, you're seeing this definition come up somewhere. Okay, so it's so important that you need to know. And to be honest, you need to know it because electronegativity is at the heart of um, chemical bonding. If you can get that concept right, you'll be okay. You might have seen it before when you were studying trends in the periodic table, or you might not have studied that chapter yet. Okay, why do we need to know it? Well, we need to know it simply because we need to determine um, the type of bonding going on. So, intra molecular bonding and inter molecular bonding, there's two types, and within both types, there's three subdivisions each. So, intra molecular bonding is forces within a molecule. Okay, this is within a molecule now, guys. Whereas inter molecular bonding is forces between molecules. To give you a quick example, we'll look at, we'll look at um, let me see, water, H2O. Okay, oxygen, two hydrogens here. Okay, you have your bonds there, or your electrons, hydrogen electron there. Okay, um, and we'll just say that as our example, okay? You don't even need to know why the shape is like that at the moment. So we know that if you have a cup of water, you're not gonna have one molecule of water, of H2O. You're gonna have millions of them. Now we can't represent that on paper, it's not practical. So what we're representing, we just rep draw two or three of them in, at least two. And we know that there is some sort of bonding taking place between each of the, um, between each of the waters. Okay, so I'm going to do a different colour pen for this. Now, intra molecular bonding is the bonding between, um, oh sorry, the bonding within a molecule, I should say. Okay, so see the hydrogen and oxygen bond here, and likewise over here as well. These are both intra molecular bonds. Okay, it's bonding within a molecule. Now, there is also bonding um, that takes place between molecules, and we represent them with a dotted line. Okay. And again, I'll explain later on why the hydrogen goes to oxygen, but for now, just realize that there is bonding between um, molecules as well. Okay, so this is intermolecular bonding. And we generally represent intermolecular bonding with a dotted line, whereas intramolecular bonding is a straight line. So this is within, and then this is between. Okay, um, if you're unsure about the definitions, I always remember it, um, at least in the early days, that inter has an E in it, and between also has an E in it. Whereas within, it's just, there's no E, okay? Um, I only just, it's just a memory aid that um, I advise students to use at the beginning because you know yourself, um, it's very easy to mix up these definitions. So, within, between. Okay, we're gonna be coming back to this later on anyhow. Um, now we're gonna specifically focus in on intra molecular bonding. Now I said there's three types, and there's three types for both. Okay, so intramolecular bonding has, and you've seen these already, you've heard of ionic bonding and you've heard of covalent bonding. Okay, so that shouldn't be anything new. Okay, ionic bonding is the force of attraction between oxidally charged ions. 
in truth, this doesn't come up very often in exam papers. So I think it's only come up like a handful of times. And you'll see I have done one or two of them um, in the upcoming videos. Whereas covalent bonding is divided up into two sections, polar and non-polar. Now students always get het up on this, okay? It's actually grand, okay? So I'll explain how um, uh, the difference between them now, okay? Polar covalent bonding is the unequal sharing of electrons, whereas non-polar covalent bonding is the equal sharing of electrons. Okay, so I want you to imagine this, and I always use this analogy when I'm teaching um, when I'm teaching chemical bonding. Okay, you're going to the cinema with your buddy. Okay, there's two of you there, and you both have um, a bag of popcorn. Okay, you're sharing a bag of popcorn. Okay, if you both eat the same amount of popcorn each, okay, that's non-polar covalent except for place popcorn for electrons. However, say you're in the cinema there and you're eating away and you look across and you notice that your buddy there um, is eating more popcorn than you are. Well, then that's unequal sharing. Okay, you're still sharing the popcorn, but it's now unequal. Okay, so that's now, we class that as polar covalent. Okay, um, and in this case, obviously, we're dealing with electrons instead of um, popcorn or Maltesers. Um, okay, so just to go into a little bit more detail on them, um, let's just pick an example. We're going to say HCl. How do I know which is polar and which is non-polar? I'll explain that in a second, but I'm just going to show you HCl. Okay. Dot here and X here. Again, it doesn't matter which you do for the X's um, and so forth. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hydrogen has one. Grant. Okay. Now, polar or non-polar? How do we figure it out? Okay. Well, you're going to be given a molecule like this, HCl, and you can draw it out, and you can draw it out here, and you're going to be asked, is this polar covalent or non-polar covalent? Okay. If it's ionic, ionic, by the way, guys, it's going to always be between a metal and a non-metal. Okay. Hydrogen and chlorine are both non-metals, so it's not ionic. Uh, it has to be covalent. So how do I figure this out? Well, this is going to bring us back to electronegativity. Okay, so I'm just going to go down here to electronegativity again. So we have something called electronegativity difference, and we use this difference to figure out if it's non-polar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. And you can see here are some values. So if something is 0 to 0 0.4, it's non-polar. If something is 0 0.4 to 1.7, it's polar covalent. And if something is greater than 1.7, it's ionic. In your log tables, on the periodic table there, you will have electronegativity um, uh, periodic table there. Okay, uh, So there will be a guide there for you. Okay, And if you get the difference between them, and I will be doing plenty of those in the exam papers, um, you can figure out if it's polar covalent, non-polar covalent, or ionic very fast. All you're doing is a simple, very, very simple, subtraction um, a formula, that's it. You take it one from the other. Now I'm going to say for argument's sake that HCl is polar covalent. So that means the electrons have not been shared equally. So I'm telling you now that HCl is polar covalent. Okay. Um, so if something is polar covalent, that must mean there's going to be a charge um, associated with both the um, with, you know what, I'll keep on this um, colour, with both the hydrogen and the chlorine. Now, they're still sharing an electron here, but at any one stage, because electrons are always moving within the bond, at any one stage, they're going to be closer to one side than the other side. And when we do that, we represent it by something called a delta sign. So this is the delta sign here. And we represent, that's basically what we're going to call a dipole. Okay, a dipole is a partial charge. So there should be a partial charge on um, on both the hydrogen and the chlorine. Now you have to put in the delta symbol there, because if you don't, and you just leave it as a positive or negative, then you're going to um, assume, you're almost assuming then it's ionic, which is the force of attraction between oxidly charged ions. This is not an ion, it's a partial charge, it's a dipole. So I wrote down just um, a plus and a minus there, and how do I know that's a plus and how that's a minus? Well, it's very simple. The more, the most electronegative atom is going to have the delta sign here, uh, negative. So that means the electrons are going to be closest to that of um, the chlorine, which chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. I think it's 3.5 and hydrogen is um, 2.1. Um, so therefore the chlorine electrons are going to be, sorry, 
Therefore, the electrons within the bond are going to be closer to the chlorine side than they are to the hydrogen side. Now, they're still being shared, um, but there is a dipole now associated with it. And we put a minus here because electrons, if you look at their charges individually, are negative. So therefore, if one side is um, if one side has more electrons, well then that side is going to be the, the negative dipole here. And then um, by default, the other side has to be the positive dipole. But I can't stress this enough. They are still sharing these electrons here. It's just that the electrons are closer to the chlorine side than the hydrogen side. And again, it's very easy to figure it out. You go down here to your electron activity difference. Okay. You figure out if it's going to be non-polar or polar covalent, grand. In this case here, it is polar covalent. Um, and then you want to figure out, well, how do we know which of the dipoles going to be? If it's going to be a positive or a negative, whichever is the electro most electronegative atom, that's going to be the negative chlorine was. Okay, and again, you can see all of this on the log tables or your periodic table for electronegativity. Now, non-polar is a little bit trickier. <coughs> So let's just pick another one here for non-polar because I just know off the heart myself, okay? And I'm going to pick H2 so I don't have to draw in as many electrons. So H, we'll do an X there. Dot there, we'll do another H here. Okay, so we have H2 here. Um, so again, I know automatically it's going to be um, non-polar and it's very simple. You just go to your electronegativity value and if you do 2.1 minus 2.1, you're going to get 0. And if we go down over here, 0 to 0 0.4 is non-polar. Okay, so we know it's non-polar. Sometimes you call this um, pure covalent when it's um, a 0. Pure covalent um, um, bonding. Now, what's actually happening here if the electrons have been shared equally? Well, what's actually happening there is, and again, I'll, I'll actually use this, there is dipole there. We have a delta positive there and delta negative here okay so there are your partial charges but because the electrons are always moving which they are within this bond okay so a split second they might be close to this hydrogen over here so that's why the delta negative is um is there on this one and this one here is a delta positive but then a split second later you might have on the other one you might have them swapping okay actually you will have them swapping so it's like a i, I always use the uh, light switch analogy. If you keep flicking on and off the light switch there, okay, um, that's what's happening with these dipoles here, okay, because electrons are always moving, okay, so at one stage they become more, one hydrogen becomes more negative than the other one, but then a split second later it swaps and then the other hydrogen becomes more, um, more um, negative than the other one and so forth, okay. Um, generally, gases such as H2, BR2, um, Cl2, all of those gases are going to be non-polar. And you can check it. Okay. Uh, and again, you go to, down to your electronegativity difference here. Now you can see here, I have a 0 0.4 here and I have a 0 0.4 here. And some of you might be wondering, how is that possible? Okay. Is 0 0.4 a non-polar covalent or is it po um, polar covalent? Well, in actual fact, it can be either. Okay. It could technically, because it's not like... As soon as you get to 0 0.4, that's this, that's the cutoff point there now, guys. Um, and everything above that is going to be polar covalent. It's not so black and white. So 0 0.4 can be non-polar covalent, or you could say it is weakly, weak or slightly polar covalent, if you know what I mean. Okay, so you can write down either in your exams, and you'll see it's always there in exams. You can say either, you can say non-polar covalent, or you can say slightly polar covalent. You write down one of them, though. Okay, and you stick to it, uh, and it'll be grand. So, and again, it doesn't matter. Uh, you'll see in exams, it's it's fairly um fair for that because you might get one there that is um that is in a grey area, shall we say? Okay, let's move on. Interelective bonding. So this bonding between um compounds. Okay, between molecules. And again, there's three types: van der Waals dipole dipole and hydrogen bonding. Um. And they're important. Uh, you need to know the strengths of them. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest, then dipole-dipole, and then van der Waals. That's particularly important for organic chemistry, which is a huge part of your course. So you definitely need to know this inside out. So bonding between, how do we know which is which? So if I gave you, let's say for argument's sake there, I gave you, what was the last one we did was H2, wasn't it? 
So I said H2 here. And I did another H2 here. Cross and cross. Okay. Um, and we draw, remember, our interminable bonding. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do a different colour for this one here just to make it stand out a little bit more. Um, we know we do a dotted line for um, interminable bonding. So how do we know what type of interminable bonding this is? Well, it actually relates right back to your intraminable bonding. So you have to figure out the intraminable bonding for it because each one is, is associated with each one of these. Generally, you could just learn it off if you want. For Van der Waals, um, forces there, guys, generally it's going to be non-polar covalent. I'll explain why. Okay, so I said already that H2 was non-polar covalent. That's what we did up here. And we figured it out using your electronegativity values. Okay, um, 2.1, which is hydrogen, minus 2.1 will give you zero. So it has to be non-polar because that's what um, this table here is. This table, by the way, you have to learn off yourself. It's not in, English. It's not in your log tables. So we now know that this over here is going to be Van der Waals. why is it van der Waals? Now, just a quick um, property on van der Waals there. Van der Waals are incredibly weak, okay? Uh, and the weaker these are, the more likely they're going to be at gases at room temperature, okay? To lower the boiling points and so forth, okay? So I'll explain why. It's actually it's not that difficult. Let's just say there's a dipole associated here. And that's what van der Waals is. It's, it's um, sorry, non-polar is. It's these temporary dipoles. So we'd say there's a, a delta sign there, a delta sign here. I would say this one's a negative and this one's positive. And obviously there's going to be a delta sign over here and a delta sign here. So that's your partial charges. Now, this is the way it has to go. Between the two hydrogens of different molecules, I have a, the positive one here bonding to the negative one here. Okay, that's always the way. Opposite charges attract. Okay, so that's something you have to remember off by heart. Opposites charges attract. Don't say opposites attract because that's not always the case, um, not in chemistry. But opposite charges attract. Okay, so it has to be a hydrogen H a dipole positive there with a dipole negative sign of it. But remember what I said before, these electrons are always moving. So within a split second, this now becomes a delta negative and this becomes a delta positive. Okay, and that's con continuously happening for all the hydrogen atoms. Okay, well, look at it now. We can't have a negative, dipole negative hydrogen bonding with a dipole negative hydrogen over here. So what's actually happening is that this bond breaks instantly once the dipole changes. So what's happening there is, and then it goes back to being, um, it goes back to being, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It goes back to being a positive or they change and then they can reform the dipole again over here or the intermolecular bond. So the bonds, what I'm trying to say there, guys, are constantly breaking and forming, breaking and forming, okay? And the reason being is these dipole charges are changing the whole time, okay? And you can only have opposite charging, charges attract, okay? So that negative can only bond to another um, positive dipole over here. And as soon as those change, well, then the bond breaks. So that's why van der Waals is so weak. Now, dipole, dipole. Well, one of our other examples earlier was HCl, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was. And I'm actually going to just use HCl here again. So copy that. And we'll go down here. So we have our HCl there. And we know it's going to bond to another HCl. Okay. So what I might do there, guys, is I'm just going to get rid of the electrons here. Just to make things a little bit easier to, um, to read. Now, the good news is for HCl, if we're looking at it, um, they don't change in which the dipoles here, these dipoles here, they're permanent dipoles. Okay, they don't change. Okay, so you're going to have the delta negative here, uh, dipole, um, positive, ne uh, excuse me, negative dipole, and again, confusing my um, dipoles and deltas, but they're the same really. Um, negative dipole bonding to the 
positive dipole over here and these won't change so therefore the bond here is more consistent okay so this is why we call it dipole dipole because they're between two dipoles again we have opposite charges attracting here okay so all I'm going to do here is going to write down dipole dipole so generally not always but generally polar covalent is if it's intraamnic bonding for polar covalent then it's probably going to be dipole dipole but not always okay so just to bear that one in mind okay now hydrogen bonding what's the story with that okay um, and we'll look we'll look at a, um, a key example and that's going to be water but before we get to that we have NOF to pay attention to hydrogen bonding can only take place if you have a hydrogen bonding to either a nitrogen or an oxygen or a fluorine it has to be one of those three elements hydrogen has to bond to one of those three okay if we're seeing so far we had hydrogen bonding to the hydrogen therefore it can't be hydrogen bonding over here we have hydrogen um, bonding to a chlorine no good has to be either nitrogen oxygen or fluorine so let's look at water h2o so oxygen goes here and we put in our two hydrogens here like so and we'll do another oxygen over here and again don't be worrying about the shape guys you can be learning about that pretty soon okay and we assign their deltas okay so just i'm going to do it for you because I, I know them already um it's going to be negative negative these are going to be positive and again how do i know that well i go back up to my electronegative values and i'll see that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen okay so what's going to happen there is the bonding between them so guys is simply going to be the hydrogen and oxygen there so again a dotted line so this is my hydrogen bonding hydrogen bonding one of the properties of it is it's the strongest bonding um, between intermolecular forces okay so that's why water has a really high boiling point 100 degrees celsius um so that's it there guys for um intermolecular bonding so inter is bonding between um molecules and there's three types van der waals dipole dipole and hydrogen bonding grand how do we know which relates to them well generally if it's non-polar covalent it'd be van der waals um and simply because these dipoles over here they're constantly changing and they're constantly changing the bond here is breaking which explains why van der waals is so weak then we have dipole dipole so this is for permanent dipoles so we go down over here and again if it's polar covalent it will be it will have a permanent dipole so hcl is our example there we have a chlorine dipole negative is bonding to the hydrogen of the different chlorine of the different hcl molecule which is a, dipole, a positive dipole so therefore dipole dipole and then hydrogen bonding well hydrogen bonding is the easiest one to, to remember um, at least for me anyhow that it needs a hydrogen to bond with either nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine it has to be one of those three okay and if it's between molecules it will have hydrogen bonding okay which means it's the strongest and again, if you're not sure about the dipole, the charges and so forth, check which is the most electronegative atom and that's going to be the, um, the negative charge. Um, and that's it guys for those. I told you already I wasn't going to be doing VSTPR um, in this um, for the shapes. Um, and again, I have that explained uh, in a previous chemistry video on the actual scripted lesson. And I also have it on the upcoming um, videos. So just to recap there very, very quickly, because it's such an important chapter, you need to know this definition of electronegativity. Okay. Um, there is a certain values attached to each element. And if you get the difference between each of the elements for, um, oh, where is this? For it, you can figure out if it's non-polar covalent, polar covalent or ionic very, very fast. Whichever um, is the one that is more electronegative, that's going to be the one that is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's going to be one with the positive, the negative dipole, and in this case here, chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. It has the negative dipole, whereas these two are the same. So if they're the same, I decide it's probably going to be nonpolar, and um, not probably it will be nonpolar unless you're told differently, I suppose. Um, 
So polar covalent is the unequal sharing of electrons, non-polar covalent is the equal sharing of electrons. Both molecules are sharing their electrons. It's just one of them is sharing it equally, uh, and the other one is not so equal. And by knowing the intra-molecular bonding, you can figure out the intermolecular bonding, which we just discussed there uh, a moment ago. Um, so that's really, really important. Another thing that's important for polarity there and non-polar is, and this goes back to the last one, um, is that like substances dissolve in like substances. So you might have heard of that before. It's going to be very important for organic chemistry. Um, so like substances dissolve in like substances. So I explained early on that water was polar. Okay. Um, so therefore, if I wanted something to dissolve in water, it also has to be polar covalent. Okay. If I got oil, which is non-polar covalent, oil does not dissolve in water because you're trying to dissolve something that's non-polar into something polar. It doesn't work. They have to be the same. So we say like substances dissolve in like substances. So it affects solubility. And that's really, really important. So if something, if you want to dissolve something in oil or something along those lines, something organic, um, which is non-polar usually, well, then you need to use another non-polar substance. And likewise, if you want to dissolve something in a polar substance like water, well, you need to use another polar substance. That's really, really important. Okay, everybody, um, we'll leave it at that um, for this. I hope you took something from this. It's definitely a video that you kind of have to go back over every now and then, and it's such an important chapter. Um, so if you don't get it the first time, because there is a lot there, relax. Just go back to it in a few days' time. Okay, and you'll see it'll start to seep in one way or another. Okay, everybody, good luck with this.